I'd like to introduce to you uh, Jason Dunyon, who was one of our graduates from uh, 1999. That's when I originally know him. He's, he originally went to, for, uh, to uh, La Crosse as an undergraduate, then he came here and did a master's degree. Um, and I remember being on his master's committee working with uh, not just cloud motion, but atmospheric motion vectors. Of, so it was mainly cloud, cloud motions you were focusing on at the time with Chris. And um, from there he went, after he got his master's, he went on to uh, uh, work with um, uh, HRD in Florida. And um, the entire time when he was there versus when he was here, he maintained a lot of connections with uh, Chris Bellin's group. And he's, still, he's still listed on there as one of the collaborators for the uh, tropical cyclone page that they do. So he's, he has very close connections, has maintained those clo close connections <laughs> with SSEC over this period. He went to um, HRD where he was working. He's the, uh, I would consider him the heir apparent to Frank Marx, but you may not think that. <laughs> but uh, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago now, you moved to Connecticut. That's right. And you still maintain your, your ties uh, with um, HRD, but on a contractual basis. So uh, with HRD, he's been doing a lot of uh, field work, uh, working with their P3 program and all the observations they do. He worked with uh, TCI, which I was involved with, and Shout, and I think a number of other programs. And, and uh, he is the real go-to guy when, it, when you talk about arranging flight patterns and setting up the experiment design for, for things. He's, when, when I was putting together a proposal last year, you know, I was thinking, gee, we need, we need um, Jason in this. But, but Jason is, is really the go-to guy. He's recognized nationally for his ability to set up experiments. And um, anyway, so in the last um, couple years, you began to work with the University of Albany on getting a PhD. How many years ago now did you get it? It's been a couple of years, two years. Two years ago with, with Thorncroft. So he now is uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Duncan. So um, that's pretty cool. And um, he's continuing to work with my project. He works with Chris. And he works um, with a lot of people collaborating on, on a number of things with tropical cyclones. So I'll leave it to you and you can explain more of what you do because it's so numerous I can't <laughs> I can't mention it all. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. I like the pointer, so I'm gonna stick with the pointer. If you have questions while we're while I'm talking, just interrupt me anytime. I like that. So feel free to jump in. I also quickly want to thank Paul Menzel, Bill Smith and Chris back there for taking on a, a social worker way back in the day. I was about a month out of social work and I didn't know anything so thank you for that and um, whether it was worth it or not I don't want to know but I appreciate it because uh, I was definitely off the beaten path this we're going to talk today a little bit about the Darnell cycle this is kind of a side 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 project and I always try to tell students if you can maintain five percent of your time to explore and play around it's time well spent and that's what this project really is it's a side maybe a side 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 project I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation here, understanding and describing this idea of the Darnell cycle. Is it fundamental and why does it matter for tropical cyclones? And then really I want folks to start thinking about recognizing it, not just in operations when I gave a talk at the Hurricane Center, but anybody who's looking at this stuff in real time to start thinking a little bit differently about it. We'll do a satellite perspective, um, a modeling perspective that gets us to our break at 4.15, but be back at 4.30. Nobody's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have an ob observational perspective. And if this is true, there really will be a TC Darnell Cycle quiz, 25% of your grade, to kind of think about recognizing this stuff. And I'll just wrap it up. All right, so satellites. Let's keep it rolling so I don't really have to take a break before 15. So here's the side, side, side project just playing around. And it was really a simple idea. It was to take an infrared image of Katrina, in this case, at T minus six hours. And I want to take one at T0 hours, and I just want to see 
how has that cloud field changed over time? Super simple. So I did it and I stretched the differences so that they look more like the, the IR, so it's these bright temperatures are cooling over time, over that six hours. And there's, for Katrina, this curious kind of ring. So the side, side, side project, we, way leads on to way. Unfortunately, it went into the Indiana Jones warehouse for a couple of years, actually. I just didn't have time to finish it. But there was something interesting about that Katrina shot, so I went back to it. And I started playing around with storms like Felix. So here in 2007, powerful Cat 5, pretty symmetric, chugging through the Caribbean. But watch right about here, it starts to kind of blow itself apart, right? This big convective arm starts to peel away from the storm. That's the diurnal cycle. This is what we call a diurnal pulse, which is a part of the diurnal cycle. And it's probably an inertial gravity wave. But basically, it starts to peel away from the storm. It's a lot easier to see in the differencing imagery where we're going to look for this ring, right? This, this diurnal pulse ring, yellows to reds. Here it comes. And it starts to slowly propagate away from the center of the storm. And actually, there's a lot of warming that happens, in this case, 5 to 40 C, behind that diurnal pulse. So if we just look at the top two images, you're just looking at IR, you could say, well, that's just a bunch of cirrus blown around at the top of the storm. So here we are at the time zero. It's The process hadn't started up yet. And then several hours later, we've got this nice diurnal pulse. Well, what if we look at 37 gigahertz, where the sensitivity is down near, say, 600 millibars, 700 millibars. And 85 gigahertz, a little bit more ice scattering, so we're a little bit higher up. Let's look at how the storm looks matched up to these images, time zero, and then several hours later. So it's expanding in what seems to be a deeper layer of the storm. It's not just the cirrus canopy expanding. So let's do a bigger data set now. Let's do a 10-year data set of major hurricanes in the Atlantic to try to get some stats. So here's our case from Felix. There's our diurnal pulse. And we're going to look at systems that are mature, so CAT 2 and above, that's where the signal seems to be the most robust. Here, what time of day is this happening? Ah, you've got my next slide. Deep in the end start? You want to know what time it starts. That's my next slide. You're my straight man for the audience. So I'll answer that in a second. So we're looking for mature TCs, low shear, because if there's a lot of shear, we're not going to get a good signal with the clouds, right? There's going to be a lot of asymmetries. And we want to be far from land because the overland diurnal cycle, where you get these peaks in the evening, much different than oceanic. So it starts to get a little bit muddled. And you can imagine we could take an azimuthal mean of these temperature, six hour temperature trends at any radius, in this case 400 kilometers. And if we do that, we've got time, this is three days for Felix. There's that temperature trend. We get this interesting heartbeat clock, right? And you can imagine. It's the, these cool peaks are when the diurnal pulse, that ring, is passing by 400 kilometers. So we can get the same thing with our 10-year data set. It's a little bit smoother, but you can see 31 major hurricanes in the Atlantic. Danielle in the East Pack has it going. A little bit out of phase, but it's got the heartbeat. Same thing with Fanopi, the heartbeat. But of course, you know, meteorologists, we love to live in Z time, it's kind of going to Michael's question, we just have to get out of Z time for this. If we bring everybody into local standard time, there's the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Mother Nature does not throw you a bone like this very often, right? So what we're seeing is no matter where you are, this diurnal cycle is pretty predictable as far as how it will behave. How does the spectrum look? This is frequency in cycles per day of our 11 micron imagery from all those 10 years of hurricanes. Here's our power spectrum. The red line is 99% significance. So at 100 kilometers radius away from the storm, we're just not seeing a lot here, right? But at 200 and 300, 4, 5, 600 kilometers, pretty far from the storm, we've got a nice power signal there. There's definitely a nice one day, once per day signal in the imagery. There's even some hints of some sub things going on that I'm honestly not sure what to make of. At this, at this time, anyway. So we've got something that looks pretty predictable as long as you get to local time. So let's introduce this idea of this clock. So it's a 24-hour clock, and it's basically telling you where is the diurnal pulse going to be at any particular time of day, right? So here's our sunset time, roughly. 
So what tends to happen in this kind of late evening, early morning hours, that's the bubbling and brewing in the inner core. That's where things are starting to crank up a bit. It kind of goes to Michael's question. So it's sunset that this all really starts. By 4 to 8 a.m., it's reaching 200 kilometers, and it makes its way out to 4 and 500 kilometers by the next afternoon to late afternoon. So here we are just after sunset with, in this case, Emily. Very compact Cat 4. There's the differencing. And here it goes, 2300, looks like something's starting. By 2 o'clock in the morning, there's some activity at, say, 150 kilometers. And notice the cloud shield up near Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, how much radially this storm, if you will, exhales. By 4 a.m., it's right on the clock, right? We would predict it would be right near 200 kilometers. It's right about there. 8 a.m., now these convective arms are peeling away from the inner core, right? They, they look kind of like random features, but if you compare it to the differencing imagery, it's marking the area of the diurnal pulse. By 11, 1400, so 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then 6 p.m. Notice at 2 o'clock, all this cloud cover over Hispaniola. This storm has reached out to its environment, right? Hispaniola was in the clear as this was moving by. And then by the end of the day, at dinner time, it's all compact again. But of course, it's about to start up all over again, which is what it did do. Earl's a neat case. We were flying with NASA with grip. So here's infrared and differencing, 2100. Here we come at midnight. Notice all this peripheral convective activity. By 6 a.m., it's pretty close to being right on the clock. 9 a.m., and you can see how it's just expanding really quickly, radially, over time. High noon at the OK Corral. And then 1500. The storm looks a lot different than when it started this cycle. And then 1800, it's going to start all over again. <laughs> Does it have to be a strong storm? It doesn't. That's where the signal tends to be the most impressive. But some of these weak systems are kind of interesting. Like if you look at Emily later on as it crossed the Yucatan into the Gulf of Mexico, pretty shabby looking. It's got an open eye wall on the north side here. Here we are at 2200. Here we go with the bubbling and brewing in the inner core. These cloud tops are up near minus 70, minus 80, which is pretty cold in the tropics. Four o'clock in the morning. And then by 7 a.m., it's pretty clear we're right on the diurnal cycle, right on the clock here, right? And watch how this storm radially expands into Mexico. It's pretty incredible how much cirrus it sends out as it expands. A lot of transverse bands along the leading edge. There's our nice pulse at 300 kilometers or so. 1300, notice this huge convective arm, right? Kind of peeling away from that inner core convection. Again, it's not a random feature. It's really tied to the leading edge of our pulse which looks a lot more symmetric when you take the differencing. It really pops out at you. And here's what it looks like in the afternoon. So suddenly it's much more compact again. It actually popped out a, a nice small eye at this point. And you can see it's kind of wrapped up its cycle. So is the uh, reformation of a, a compact center uh, a time delay from the solar maximum, or is it because the sun's going down? I think the sun going down starts the whole process of this release in the upper levels. And whether or not the eye will shrink, it depends on the, the situation. Sometimes the eye won't make any changes to Is that what you're getting at, how the eye might change? Sometimes it may not change. But I have noticed behind the pulse, sometimes an eye that, that wasn't there will actually pop out. Because you do get warming behind it, so you get this opening up of the storm. But I think I don't have a good answer for your question. What I would say. Have you calculated the Rossby radius of deformation on that? I haven't done the Rossby radius on these. That might be interesting to do. Because it's the, it's the environment that's receiving all this. Um, and in the anticyclonic environment, it's probably more favorable to receiving it. So, no, I have not done that. But nevertheless, it's, it's a very large radius that you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Here's our heartbeat at 400 kilometers for all our storms. Where did Emily fall in? Well, it was right on the diurnal cycle, right up to landfall. And even some of these weaker systems, like pre-Carl, this is just a, a tropical wave southeast of Puerto Rico. Pretty unorganized, 2100. But notice at about 3 o'clock in the morning, it starts to pop off mm -hmm. some convection. By 6 AM, even more. By 9 o'clock in the morning, there's some hints that maybe there's something circular here. And that continues into noon, 
1500, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, where suddenly we've got everything warming in this inner area. We've got this expansion out behind it. But the storm has basically reached out to the environment. You can almost think of it as maybe cleaning out the dry air that's all around it as it does that. You can see how different the environment looks after it goes through the cycle. Checking on the cousins, I always like doing that over Africa because there's no time difference. 10 a.m. is 10 z, I love that. So here's our MCS, and here's our difference thing. So it's right on the clock. It's at 10 a.m. It's about 300 kilometers. And watch how quickly this MCS convection collapses as we get into the afternoon local time. You can see lots of these transverse looking bands. Here we are at 1600, 17, 18, 19. The scene looks very different. It's hard for an MCS to make the transition out over the ocean, right? These MCSs that are embedded in tropical waves. So there's a question in my mind of, well, what about the timing of when these come off? You know, maybe that's not the most favorable timing when the convection is dying and it's coming off over these cooler waters. Maybe there's a more favorable time for some of these systems. So that might be interesting to look at, too. Upper level outflow, always interesting to me. So looking at the differencing, <clears throat> this is the Sims water vapor winds. It's probably tough to see. Hopefully that screen can help. But the blues are 100 to 250. It's very cyclonic in the inner 300 kilometers of this storm. And here's the Sims upper level divergence. So they're taking GFS as a background field and using recursive filtering to get these water vapor winds into the analysis. So what you see is, kind of a peak at upper level divergence, even upper level convergence over here to the northwest. That's midnight. This is our old case. Here comes that diurnal pulse that we already saw. Suddenly we start, start seeing a lot more divergent flow out at about 300 kilometers, and it really starts to pick up. And notice our upper level divergence starts to become, the magnitude goes up, and it becomes more symmetric. That's 9 a.m. 12 o'clock, our pulse is moving out. <clears throat> Notice all these water vapor winds are almost purely divergent, um, except for maybe that northwest side, where we still have um, maybe a little bit of upper level convergence. 1300, now we're kind of at the peak of our diurnal cycle. Notice the, the field looks quite a bit different. In that 15 hours we just looked at, the magnitude of that upper level divergence just about doubled, and the aerial extent was about four times larger. So upper level divergence really was favored in the afternoon as this process kind of went through what it does every day. So if we look at local time with upper level divergence, and we can calculate it at different radii, and it doesn't really matter which one you calculate, the big picture is the peak has a heartbeat at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? when the diurnal cycle is at its maximum. That's when the storm is exhaling, basically, when it's doing its, its major exhale. So upper level divergence seems to be favored, and we're seeing this with more storms in the afternoon when this cycle is kind of at its end point. How much of that is in GFS and how much is from the water vapor? We haven't separated that. That's a great question. Looking at how some of these water vapor winds turn from cyclonic to purely divergent, I think the water vapor winds are a pretty important piece of it. But as we will talk about, the models know about the diurnal cycle, so that may be in the in the mix as well. Mm -hmm. so good question. Transverse bands and arc clouds. I won't talk much about these except for to say, any aviators in here? If you're if you're flying, you know, and we're when we're on the G4 jet up about forty-five thousand feet, when we see these transverse bands, we know there's going to be probably some pretty good turbulence, right? There's a lot of vertical wind shear being suggested. So where are these transverse bands setting up? Well, they tend to be on the leading edge of the diurnal pulse, right? Not only because maybe this enhanced outflow is creating more vertical wind shear, but there's probably, they're probably easier to see because we're sending all this cirrus out into the environment. Maggie looks like a mess until you do the differencing. You see there's a nice diurnal pulse, right? So. Transverse bands are probably favored in the afternoon when this exhale is really pushing out away from the storm. Arc clouds, I've always loved these things in the tropics. And we're talking about the big ones, right? Hundreds of kilometers long. Where are these things setting up? I used to think I was noticing them in the daytime when I was working instead of sleeping. Or when I was 
looking at visible imagery, and it was at its most glorious, right? But I actually think they're happening when the diurnal pulse is reaching out. Here they are in George, beautiful one in Emily. They're happening along the leading edge of the diurnal pulse. So this thing, as it's moving through the atmosphere, seems to be kicking, and we'll talk more about it, seems to be tapping into dry air and kicking off these convectively driven downdrafts. So I think they're happening at certain times of day, not just by chance. I didn't realize I was doing this until I did the clocks, but these are all at 11 o'clock in the morning. So the, the transverse bands, um, maybe I'm completely naive. I, I think of them as uh, <clears throat> kind of propagating gravity waves. Mm. Is that, do you look at them that way? Or? Yeah, well, I think this diurnal pulse is probably an inertial gravity wave. So the I think. Use, yeah, the big one, but then. There's little ones that propagate upstream against the uh, upper upper tropospheric flow. Yeah, so, and so it's almost like this diurnal pulse might be meeting. There might be a meeting going on here. I don't know. The spokes are neat, though. Yeah, they are very neat, and they and they tend to happen on the leading edge of this feature. Um, I I can mention that we we've been talking a lot about spokes, and we see spokes occur on the edge of a low inertial stability pulse. When you get low inertial stability and you start coming on an adjustment, it breaks up into gravity waves and gives radio pulses mm. to the direction of the flow. I don't know if that actually applies here because I don't think you actually have a jet stream following that curve on the outside or any kind of a jet, but right. we'd have to look at it. Yeah, so. I think it's a wide open area to look the at. The of orange is probably low PV. Yeah. Yeah. So the Hurricane Center knows about these arc clouds, right? When they mention them in their discussions, they're talking about, well, oh, maybe there's some dry air nearby, or maybe this storm is going to be kind of arrested for a little while. It's not going to be intensifying. Or we've got some dry air at mid-levels when we see these arc clouds. So they know that it could be trouble for the storm in the short term. And they're talking about Franklin right here. And they're talking about these arc clouds. What's interesting is, I think what needs to kick off to get these going in the tropics is 45 millimeters TPW, that's a good threshold we found in our sounding study, where we've got a lot of dry air in the low to mid levels. So we've got three soundings that we identified. This was kind of a redo of the Jordan mean tropical sounding. So if you look at RH, that's the moist tropical sounding. And then you've got this, these two other classes of soundings. We've got the Saharan air layer in red, and brown is the mid-latitude dry air intrusion. Very different looking soundings, right? But 45 millimeters is a good, demarcation between the dry ones and that moist tropical. And the reason is about 99 to 95 percent of the column moisture is below 500 millibars. That's a good starting point. Another thing is in the tropics, these soundings are very similar down in the boundary layer. When the sal comes overhead, it's still incredibly moist. It's like a wet towel when they reach Miami. You don't get any reprieve from the moisture because all the dryer is above. If you want to kick these convectively driven downdrafts off, you probably want to be down near the melting level, so say six to eight hundred millibars. That's where you want to put your dry air to really get the bang for your buck with these things. So the occurrence, they're initiated with con convection near the TC peripheries, falling through these low to mid level dry layers. I think six to eight in the tropics is, is an important place to put that. And you're going to get a temporary disruption of the storm a lot of times. Look for TPW less than 45 millimeters, especially at about two to 400 kilometers away from the storm. And if you're looking at RH, look for say 40 to 45 percent or less. The moist tropical at, at this layer, the moist tropical is about 65, so much moisture. So the timing of these, that's the interesting part. They're happening in the late morning to early afternoon, say 10 to 4 o'clock. And they're, a lot of times they're happening when the pulse is reaching peripheral low to mid-level dry air. And that's tending to hang out at about two to 400 kilometers. And of course, the pulse doesn't get out to these areas until the morning to afternoon. So the storm is actually, maybe in the early morning, it's actually protected from that dry air. But it actually reaches out to the environment and maybe taps into that dry air. And it kicks off these down drives. So switch over to modeling. So this, this is uh, the Nature Run by Nolan et al., 2013. Really here, we just want to get a sense of what does the Darno cycle look like in something like the nature run. He's using 321 warp, 
I looked at the nine kilometer grid, you can see the microphysics scheme and the short wave and long wave radiation getting called every six minutes, which is good when you're looking at diurnal effects. Kind of a classic recurver in the Atlantic. Took a little while to get its act together, and then it eventually reached cap three or four, depending on which grid you were looking at. You can see the pressure trace, and there's the intensity. And it's really that blue area, days say five to 10, that it got into that cat two or more intensity, which we're interested in. So let's look at outgoing long wave radiation. Might be a good place to start if we've got these serious surges that we're seeing. So out to 450 kilometers, these are azimuthal means we'll be talking about. The full 13 days of the nature run. It's a little bit noisy. There's a lot going on here. But we're not meeting all of our criteria. Let's meet from day five to 10. Let's zoom <coughs> into that area. Then it becomes really clear that we've got these surges, right? And the dash line is uh, midnight local time. So every afternoon, we've got this reduced OLR, which I won't show it here, but it's really the ice. It's the CDO reaching out to the environment, reducing the OLR. And we're getting it day after day. Same thing goes with Q condensator rain rate. If we zoom in kind of on our study period. Notice these fingers of precipitation reaching out day after day away from the storm. And they go out pretty far, say 250 to 300 kilometers. So if you're thinking QPF, I'm very interested in features that reach out to the environment 300 kilometers, right? These diurnal pulses, which are convectively active. That's what we're seeing here. Radio wind gets really interesting to me, one kilometers and 12 kilometers. Let's zoom in again. So what you see in the red is outflow. So every afternoon, are these surges in outflow, as we're seeing in the satellite imagery. But we're also seeing it down at a kilometer, right? These blues are enhanced low-level inflow, interspersed with periods in the afternoon of really reduced low-level inflow. And it's sometimes, in a couple of cases, it's actually a little bit of outflow. Not good if you want to grow up to be a hurricane, right? Think about the hurricane circulation. You want the in, up, and out. So this period of the in seems to have a real oscillation to it. And even down at 10 meters, where it really matters, if you're a hurricane center forecaster, we've got these oscillations of 10 meter radial wind speed that are they're pretty dramatic. So something to think about, not only is the structure of the storm interesting here, but maybe the intensity and how we've got this kind of in, up, and out circulation. Let's look at the vertical velocity now, 700, 700 millibars. You can look at different levels. So we're looking down on the storm on the 6th and the 7th, two of our days of our simulation. 200, 400 kilometer range rings. Watch for these enhanced rings pushing away from the storm. And the blues are actually showing a little bit of downdraft behind these features, right? When Dave Nolan saw these, when he was first setting up his model, he thought maybe there was a problem with the model. Mm -hmm. He's like, thanks, I feel better now. That maybe there's not a problem with the model. What does this feature look like at 100 millibars? So this is just the six in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon. Not much of a signal, maybe a little bit here, but as you go down 200, three, down to about 12, 14,000 feet, 10,000 feet, it's very coherent. 925 millibars. Notice that it's smaller here. It's radially expanded later that afternoon. Less of a signal once, once we get to 1,000, it seems to disappear, at least in the nature run. But this feature, what I'm calling a diurnal pulse, is through most of the troposphere. Right? It's not just ice blowing at the top. It's something that's pushing out through a deep layer of the storm. I don't want to spend too much. You can do a whole talk on this, but this is total radiation tendency at midnight and 12 o'clock. So I'm just kind of breaking things up, but you can see there's a lot of long wave warming that happens near the melting level in the inner few hundred kilometers and also the base of the anvil. And that happens all day. But there's an interesting thing that happens out here from about seven to 13 kilometers, a little bit outside the storm, say 200 plus kilometers. There's big differences in what's happening with the total radiation tendency. And it's it looks like this all the time. It's whether or not you have the sun at play as well, right? There's that whole balance. But there's a big difference between night and day. And it transfers over to Cape. You 
start thinking about stability. So here's CAPE up to 2,500 joules per kilogram, but there are some big oscillations happening out here at say 2 to 350 kilometers in CAPE. Big oscillations. A few hundred joules per kilogram up to a few thousand. Right? There's a diurnal heartbeat going on. And you see that heartbeat if you look at CAPE at 150 or CAPE at 200 kilometers. This is going out through our entire study time. And this is the level of neutral buoyancy. So this is the top of your CAPE calculation, right? This is where you have zero neutral, this is where you become neutrally buoyant. So just pulling out 200 kilometers, CAPE seems to be peaking at about midnight in the simulation. And the level of neutral buoyancy is at its highest, right? 200, 250 millibars or so. So you have a deeper calculation to make your CAPE calculation, a deeper layer to make your uh, CAPE calculation. Cape is lowest around local noon, right? Really low. It's like almost useless low. And then we've got level of neutral buoyancy is really dropping down to about 450 millibars, even 6, 10 millibars or so. If you think about a skew T diagram, here's the moist tropical sounding in the Atlantic. Here's our level of free convection where we start our calculation. Think about the LNB. It's way up here at night, but this is where we saw the, rate, the total net cooling, right? So you can, you can imagine, at night we're shifting this sounding to the left, in the daytime we're shifting it right. So you're taking that environmental sounding and you're swinging it back and forth. And you're affecting your cape dramatically and your LNB is making huge swings. So how does that look if you look down on the storm? So going out to 500 kilometers. Two o'clock in the morning, there's our 200 kilometer range ring. There's almost no cape to work with. You know, there's a lot of warming that happens at, down at the melting level we saw. It's very stable in the inner core. But look at the periphery here. There's some big cape values. But watch what happens as we go out in time. And we start to get this cooling at night. And then we get the warming in the daytime. So this ring of really low cape expands. And then it starts to just kind of shed apart. And then by two o'clock the next night, it looks just like it did when it started. So you're basically seeing this breathing of the cape. It's not only related to the fact that you're sending ice out there that can absorb the solar radiation, but you've got this day-night difference, right? Your cape is much higher just outside the inner core at night. And in the daytime, it kind of, it's pretty squashed all the way out to 400 kilometers or so. So that peripheral environment is not nearly as conducive to kicking things off. If you want to get a diurnal pulse going, you probably want to start it sometime after sunset, which seems to be happening. We saw these surges, right, in the nature run with the 200 millibar outflow. What does h warp look like? Well, when Edward met the criteria up to here, it had radial surges in 2014 Edward. So, not a surprise, right, the nature run and h warp are cousins, um, so maybe we're not surprised to see that. But We've got really strong diurnal signals hiding out in even our operational models, not just in the nature run. Okay, so think about that model, some of the things we pulled out. What, what's the big picture here? Well, slicing through our storm, this diurnal pulse at 6 a.m. is at about 200 kilometers. And it's behaving like a squall line. That's what it looks like. I think it's a gravity wave, but behaves like a squall line. And we've got Kind of the anvil is kind of at its still pulled in, but it's about to expand. 11 o'clock, our squall line's heading out. And if there's dry air out here, like we talked about with the arc cloud, it's going to tap into them, and we're going to get those gust fronts that we saw, right, with the, the arc clouds racing out ahead of the storm. Outflow, the anvil's starting to expand. And by 2 o'clock, we're kind of at the end of our process. We're fully expanded. Squall lines are kind of getting more shallow, but They've changed quite a bit, and the low-level inflow behind these is looking like it might be disrupted as well. We'll see that in a second. So my favorite part is always the odds. So Edward, not going to win any beauty contest because it had a little bit of shear affecting it. I'm probably not going to win any beauty contest either, so we'll call it an even trade. But this storm still had a diurnal cycle going, right? So. At 300 kilometers this time, here's the 10 years of major hurricanes. And here comes our darnel pulse in red. Notice this convective arm that just suddenly appears right, randomly outside the storm. Well, it's related to this darnel pulse. 
Here we are at 1245 local. Notice the transverse bands again. And then I think we're at 1900 local. So not the most pure signal because of the shear, I think, and maybe the inner core wasn't as, as well developed as it could be, but it was right on the clock. Here's our diurnal cycle imagery, and lo and behold, here's this squall line feature in the abyss imagery, right? Actually had some arc clouds pushing out ahead of it. We were lucky enough to be flying this one. Here's the TPW, so remember, 45 and less, that's the greens, the blues. So lurking out at about 250 to 400 kilometers was a lot of mid-level dry air, low to mid-level. We had a lot of drop sounds in this system. I'll just point out a couple of them. These are going to be surface observations. But behind this feature, the moist tropical sound in the Atlantic should be in the low 80% RH down at the surface. This was down in the low 60s. That's pretty dry in, in the subtropics behind this feature. And if you look at this QT, it's nearly dry adiabatic up to 950 millibars. So it's a, it's a pretty blown out boundary layer. And then it's subsaturated up to our flight level, which is up at 700 millibars. Same thing goes with this guy, quite dry, dry adiabatic up to about 950 or so. So it's just not the best of environments right behind this feature. So can we see it in our LF radar? So this is a C-band radar on the, on the aircraft. So we've got a big domain here. I had to blow it up to really see it well. So this is storm centered. You're going to see the plane flying through the center over and over. And the gray circle is where the plane is. We won't get returns right around the storm. Here we come in from Bermuda. That's a perk of the job. You get to stay at Bermuda. Notice this huge ring. Right? Here's the eye wall right here. This is the center. This huge ring out at about 250 to 300 kilometers. We were, this is before I really started looking at this stuff. We kept going through this feature, and I thought we were just going through random outer bands because I couldn't see the whole thing at once. And now looking back at it, it's like, oh, I see what was going on. There was this huge ring that was radially propagated away from the center in the seabed. This is the Darnell Pulse. That's the radius of 34 knot winds, and I can tell you, when we were going through this thing, there were more than 34 knot winds. Of course, it's a transient feature, but it makes you think about these bands that get sent out beyond the R34. Do, do you think this Darnell cycle is directly related to creating secondary eye walls or fragments of secondary eye walls? I wonder. Talking about that with Derek just a few minutes ago. Because you're constantly, day after day, favoring action just outside the inner core, over and over and over again. In an environment that's not really, it's ripe, but there's not a lot of lift to get it going. But maybe some kind of a squall line like feature could be what it would take. Like a question, and as these bands go, as this ring goes out. How does the intensity how does the intensity of the storm itself vary after the passage of one of these? And they're more likely to undergo a rapid intensification or some sort of intensification <coughs> following this than during I don't have a good answer for that. How does this directly relate to the intensity? Because it, it's you've got this background where the shear is changing, the environment's changing. We do we have seen in the stats that the R fifty tends to increase in the afternoon. So that tells us that, the, that even the Hurricane Center is seeing a radial <coughs> expansion of the R50. Right. So that's structure. But how exactly is the intensity changing? I don't have a good answer for that yet. Because I think it's complicated. It's hard to peel out from case to case. It's got, it's got to be case to case. Mm -hmm. so the question is, how, the, how is the intensity changing during the inner core? Yeah. yeah. And it may it not. Seems that, you know, we don't have a really high resolution data, that's where the global hawk would be helpful because we'd be monitoring over a longer period of time. That's right, that's right. You would be getting center drops and getting the wind field in the inner core continuously. Because right now, the, the, you know, the transects we have in the storm, we're in there for a few hours and we're gone. Yeah. And we don't come back for another 12 hours. Right. So, <coughs> sometimes interesting stuff is happening in between those periods. Yeah. So yeah. having something like a global hawk or a drone that could, you know, stay on station for a long period of time. Yeah. It would go to a long way to answer Michael's question. So we were lucky enough to also have the tail Doppler radar. This is X-band. So we're coming, this is a cross section up to 15 kilometers out from our point A, coming in toward the center here. So here's our A to B. 
Again, coming from Bermuda, my favorite island. So we're coming in. Here's the Darnell Pulse. It's a little bit ragged looking, but right there. And there's the Darnell Pulse in the radar imagery. So as we come in, you can see the reflectivity. The Darnell Pulse is at 150 kilometers. There's a lot of reflectivity there. It's up at about, say, five and a half or six kilometers. And it's got some of the higher numbers. You know, we're talking 40, even 48 maybe DBZ. It was only higher in the inner core. So pretty impressive. Looking at the wind speed, unfortunately there were some dropouts here, but you can see there were some enhancements of 40 to 50 knot winds near this feature. And then kind of going back to Dave Nolan's when we were looking down on that storm with the ring pushing out, this is a nature one, there's that updraft, downdraft couplet. And that's the tough one. That's how Chris Belden turns into a seven bagger on our P3. Sorry, Chris, I always have to tell you. <laughs> this is the rough stuff. This is when you go up a few hundred feet and then down a few hundred feet. This would be a Chris Belden five bagger. That was, that was the roughest part of the flight, honestly. That's where it's Anytime I'm here for you, Chris. This is where, to me, it gets really interesting. So here's radial wind. Look at the gradient at 150 kilometers. So outside of this feature is an enhanced, deeper, low-level inflow, right, feeding the storm, feeding that secondary circulation. And outside of it is this enhanced upper-level outflow. Right? It looks a lot different. This is, this is not a great environment right here, feeding into the storm. I almost imagine it being Think about this background secondary circulation, right? This in, up, and out. Suddenly you've got this darnel pulse that behaves like a squall line that you're superimposing on top of it. It has its own in, up, and out, right? So it's going to enhance low-level inflow out ahead of it, and it's going to enhance upper-level outflow out ahead, of, out ahead of it as well, because it's superimposed exactly on the circulation that's already there. That makes any sense. So it's actually enhancing everything going on outside of it. And that's exactly what we see in this case. Coming in with our P3, we're flying at 10,000 feet. So we don't, you can see we don't get any data right there um, with the radar. What did it look like at the Darnell Pulse? Well, the flight level winds peaked at 79 knots. And the SFMR, which is a microwave instrument measuring the surface winds, which is, it's really the go-to instrument for the hurricane center on both the Air Force and NOAA aircraft, peaked at almost hurricane force. Right? So we saw the strongest winds in the storm outside of the inner core, way out at 150 kilometers with this feature. Here's the problem with these things if you look in, in history. So this tailed off the radar, this X-band, it's scanning fore and aft about 20 or 25 degrees. So if we want to really cut through these with our <coughs> tailed off the radar, we've got to penetrate them. Right? We can't just scoot across them. So watch the Earl case as we come in from St. Croix. Notice this interesting circular feature here. But look what the aircraft keeps doing. Goes through the inner core of it. Comes up short. Oh, not quite. Goes through that one because it's got a hit on So what tends to happen is our best penetrations of these features are on the ferries to and from the storm. Because scientifically, if you're staring down a 45 dBZ line of convection, you're gonna, the flight director is going to say, Jason, duh, do we really want to keep going or can we turn back now? And you know, he's much more excited when he says, can we turn back now? So you come up short. Because I'm not going to scientifically, I'm not going to put the aircraft through that if I have no reason to do it. But maybe there is a reason to do it. right? Maybe we really want to go through these things, not just on the ferries. Would that be a good use for the coyote, perhaps? I'd love to see the coyote go through one of these. Yes. Yep. That coyote is a small UAS that um, Derek's talking about. It's launched actually from the P3. It's got a duration right now of about 60 minutes. Small US, UAS, UAS, probably like a wingspan like that. All right, so landfall. We've seen all these outer bands. So here's Nate, looking pretty shabby, 80 knots. Here's New Orleans. There's our clock and our differencing imagery. Notice what looks like a small diurnal pulse right here. It starts heading up toward New Orleans. Faster than the storm, right? It's radially expanding. And there we are at 12 o'clock. 
What does it look like on the radar? So here's the differencing. Here's the radar. There are the OBS at um, MSY. Notice this interesting convective line. It just comes zooming toward New Orleans. It brings with it gusts up near 28 knots or so, right? So interesting that just like in the other, you know, we talked about the arc clouds and these convective bands, that there seems to be these interesting convective elements that usually we would just call this an outer band that was coming by. But I wonder if some of these have some predictability to them. And it gets really interesting when you look at Harvey, even after <coughs> landfall, right? This is back in 2017, really caused a lot of problems in Texas and uh, Gulf Coast as well. Here we are at midnight. Notice this interesting convective band peeling away from the inner core, right? It just starts to peel away. And it's right on the diurnal clock. And it has this, it's huge, right? It's hundreds of kilometers long. And when you look at the IR, you know, what is this thing? But you look at the differencing and you see how circular it is. So for whatever reason, the convection's being favored on this side, right? It goes from Brownsville all the way up to north central, te uh, east Texas. 10 o'clock, we'll stop there. Huge. So what does this look like in the radar? Well, here we're going to start again. There's some observations from uh, Galveston. Here we go with this kind of peeling away. Now we're getting gusts up near 38 knots in Galveston. There's that feature again. But notice this convective line, how long it is, right? And this storm is actually moving, drifting west-northwest, almost not even moving. But this thing is on the move, and it's away from the inner core. And it's huge. Oh, I'll go back. So again, what looks like this random convective arm looks like it's tied to the diurnal so right on the clock. Irma was a neat one coming in toward, neat if you're not on, near Puerto Rico, of course. Three o'clock in the morning, here comes the diurnal pulse. It's just east, maybe near Culebra, it's just east of Puerto Rico. So are we gonna see another one of these convective lines? Well, there's a convective line. And they had gusts to over tropical storm force winds, right? And that thing continued to peel across Puerto Rico, reached Mayaguez and La Peguera on the southwest corner, hours ahead of when the actual R34, which at this time was right here, just approaching the east coast, right? So again, it's a transient feature. The Hurricane Center wouldn't want to forecast on this R34, but if you're thinking about preparing yourself, you might want to watch these. We call them outer bands, but maybe they're not quite outer bands the way we thought about them. <clears throat> and what's interesting to me here is storm motion is 285 at 14 knots. This, this line came 20 to 25 knots to the west-southwest, right? So, you know, maybe these guys thought they were going to miss it, all the action. In fact, this was the action they got in La Peguera. Most of the storm missed them. And the interesting thing about that, Jason, having been through a number of these outer bands, is, is behind it. It's, Quite calm. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that mode area in between. It's, right. I mean, the winds can go quite light, despite having you know to spin up you know gale force right. sustained gusts. Yep, exactly. And they come they come at you quick. Like you got to be if you're putting your shutters up, you got to be ready for that. Kind of going to what Derek's saying. This is the last one of the I call the landfall before the landfall. Andrew was a great case. There is that convective arm, right? Once again, seven o'clock in the morning. There's the pulse. So as this thing expands, we're going to see the storm expanding. Our pulse is going to move over the channel here, right over the Gulf Stream. And we're going to look for some kind of a line coming through now. We'll keep an eye on Miami OBS and West Palm Beach OBS. Something maybe over Grand Bahama at that point. Here it comes. It's going to get more coherent as it gets a little closer. And it peels right through. So in this case, Miami got gusts to tropical storm force. You know, why does this matter? Well, there's the inner core, still hours away. I was talking to Mark Di Maria when he saw this loop, works out at the Hurricane Center. He was putting his shutters up when this came through. He's like, I had to stop putting my shutters up and take a break and wait until Derek's little in-between time came and I could finish. So I almost I think of it as the landfall before the landfall, because it's not the true 
radius of 34 knot winds, which everybody wants to be prepared and evacuated by that time. But it's, it sends you a shot that you need to be prepared for. And it continued over the Everglades. So you can almost imagine, I'd love to have a giant C-band radar for this one. This thing has a very interesting arc look to it. All right, we're going to wrap up so you guys can go back to your business. I appreciate you coming out today. Let's think about the hurricane symbol that we've come to know and love, especially the northern hurricane, northern hemisphere version, right? It spins the right way. So here's Andrew. There's an old diurnal pulse here. And then several hours later, it's got that hook we talked about. And it's the diurnal pulse. It's got the hook that looks a lot like that. Francis, several hours later, has these little arms peeling away. Right? It's the diurnal pulse. Dora, almost like an annular hurricane. It looks like a donut today. Several hours later, it's got this strange arm peeling away from it. It's a diurnal pulse. Right? Looks like half a hurricane symbol. Bofa become, decides to become the poster child for this as this arm peels away. So I kind of say it half jesting that you know, the hurricane symbol may be more appropriate at certain times of day. Maybe in the early morning and at night, it's not so much. But when these convective arms start to peel away, lo and behold, it looks pretty slick. Also, I'm just going to drop this down. We did look at, there's a darnell signal in the Dvorak estimate. So if you're not familiar with that, this is using infrared imagery to determine the intensity. But look at all these different shapes that are part of the whole process. All these little convective arms peeling away in different directions at different radii. Looks a lot, it looks reminiscent of what we just talked about. So now we're just wrapping up with our quiz. Here's the fun part. So here's Rono, North Indian Ocean. It's on the weak side. Notice the cloud tops, very cold. What do you see up here? Transverse bands. Beautiful diurnal pulse. So what time is it? Yell it out. What time do you think it is? Two in the afternoon. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. The pulse is out at about 400 <laughs> kilometers or so which is about that time. Oh. Let's look at pre-TD Earl. Anybody notice anything? What jumps out at you? Transverse. Yeah, these interesting transverse bands. It looks like it's exhaling, but it's pretty compact, right? There's the diurnal pulse. How about a time for this one? Six, seven, in the morning. Five o'clock in the morning. Pretty good. That's what it looked like a little bit later on, right? It really blew itself out by noon time. How about Danielle? This is the western Gulf of Mexico. This is ugly, right? But look at this interesting thing. And there's the diurnal pulse. So what time would you guess this is? Anybody? 10 a.m. on the earlier side. Chapala, very compact. There's a diurnal pulse. This one's looking what time, roughly? It's early. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. It's about to make its way. It's getting out near 200 kilometers. Kilo, notice the convective arm. Beautiful diurnal pulse. So what time this time? It's 11 o'clock in the morning. Right? This one's out. That's about, it's hard to see maybe. Like 300 kilometers or so. Andrew, one of my favorites. Beautiful diurnal pulse. Time? It's 5 o'clock in the morning, right? It's early. If you're within a couple hours, you still get an 8 months. And then this is what it looked like several hours later, really greatly expanded. I'm going to go A minus, and it, or maybe even an A on that. That was pretty good for the diurnal cycle, please. So, thinking about these pulses and what, what I think are inertial gravity waves, they're really a main feature of this TC diurnal cycle. The radial propagation, we didn't talk a ton about it, but it's slow. It's 5 to 10 meters per second. It takes a whole day to evolve, right? It's a 4D phenomenon. When you think of, if you're studying diurnal convection in, you know, Africa, you think of a certain peak at a certain time of day. we got to go 4D with this. There's peaks of certain times of day, but it's moving. It's an evolving process. It makes it complicated. Po I say possibly fundamental. I think I'm you know, pretty confident to say it's a fundamental process. We're seeing it all over the world. We've got a clock to try to predict it, right? 
geostationary, excuse me, geostationary uh, satellite imagery. We're seeing that heartbeat. That's really what got this whole project going. And the pulses are forming around sunset, back to Michael's question. And they're not reaching four to 600 kilometers radius until the next afternoon. It takes a while. Best signal in strong storms, weak shear, far from land. Recognizing it in these different, different analysis methods, whether it's satellites, models, radar, aircraft, we see these convective arms, not only in IR, but also in microwave. I hope you appreciate those convective arms next time you look at a storm. Enhanced upper level outflow in the afternoon. We're seeing the heartbeat in the nature run and even in H war. Right? We're seeing convective rings and radar reflectivity, like we saw on our LF radar on the P3. And the DBZs are pretty high. And we're seeing these outer bands that reach the coastline before landfall. Think about the arc clouds. Look for this dry air at about two to 400 kilometers. If that pulse taps into the dry air, watch for arc clouds in the late morning to, say, mid-afternoon. And we're seeing the pulse or the wave reaching out to the environment. That's what it's doing. And then lastly, structure, right? We're seeing these precipitating convective arms. These things have, like we saw with Harvey, they have some serious convection when they move out. The TC is really reaching out to the environment. It kind of related to this idea of the landfall before the landfall. So that's it. I thank you guys for your time. We do have this site. You can just Google it. TC Darnell Cycle on the SIM site. So we're tracking TCs around the globe, looking for the Darnell Cycle. And I'm also with the clock as well. And we're also trying to add some extra bells and whistles to look at diversions, maybe lightning too. I didn't get into that. Um, but there's some groups I think we can still look at. So that's it. I appreciate your time. Great. Do you think that the relationship between the core intensity and the eye wall and and the existence of bands, say, in the afternoon before they move far away. Is that, do they correlate well? Yeah, I think a, a nicely developed inner core supports these diurnal pulses. I think a ragged inner core can send these ragged bands heading out. So I, I think there's a real correlation. So look for a storm that's really well put together, strong inner core, real symmetric. But there's no correlation between the inner core and, and diurnal cycle? You see a diurnal cycle in the core? Well, we see a diurnal cycle that at least the signal starts at about 150 kilometers radius. So that's at about the edge of the inner core, if you look at the Atlantic hurricanes. But what's happening, you know, you're starting, you're starting this squall line at 150 kilometers. It's got outflow on both sides. You're sending low-level outflow in toward the inner core. So it kind of goes back to Matt's question about the secondary eye wall formation, where you're, day after day, you're causing this feature to form just outside the inner core. So I wonder if it can affect the inner core indirectly. It's certainly affecting the environment just around it, right, that's feeding. Mm -hmm. Michael, you had a question too. Yeah, I was curious. You showed some nice examples of this phenomenon. Uh, but you said that in, in situations where it's a shear, it's a little bit messier. Yeah. Do you have any situations where there's very little shear, but you don't get this clean picture? Yeah. Sort of eyeball cases that... Another eyeball case tends to happen when the inner core is not really well developed. It might look it on the IR, but if you look at a radar, we've seen this in a lot of the storms we fly. It looks great in IR, and then you go fly it, and it's, it's just a mess. And those storms, I think, don't tend to really give you a great signal. And close to land can get confusing, too. But you showed some pictures of MCSs moving off in you know, Western Africa. That clearly doesn't have a, a deep core, but you can still see evidence of those. Right. I can't recall were those ones that were somewhat messy in there. I don't know if they were messy inside because we don't have any. Or, I mean, sorry, but met, were those yeah. ones that didn't have really prominent bands? Or I thought they did. Or they were, you could certainly identify them. The ones over Africa, I didn't have anything but, but IR, right. so I, okay. can't, I can't answer it. But I think those do have a nice CDO. This, you know, we saw the cape, how it kind of goes right. like this. I think a system that's got a nice CDO tends to have, yeah, that MCS probably had some kind of a mid-level circulation going. Enough that it was robust enough to, to keep going. MCSs usually don't have enough of the circulation to survive that more than a day or two. Hurricanes do. Right. So that's, to me, I'd like to study more MCSs that are long-lived. I think that would be interesting. Very interesting. In and around these uh, hurricanes, 
What would you say the like difference in both sensible and late heat release is like during these annual cycles? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. What's the difference between night and day on these? Well, would it be a little bit different though, like underneath the storm while it's already like really thick with you know humidity that's talked up or yep. just in general? Yep. So like, would it still be about the same weather? There a slight variation? I think there's going to be a variation. I mean, if you look at those, yeah. if you look at these things as if my conceptual picture kind of had them deep, really robust, and they kind of go like this as they move out. So I think you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck in the inner core. And as you move out, it's kind of a shadow of itself. Is that, is that kind of getting along with what you're thinking? Sure. Yeah. But aren't you creating a, I'm, I'm thinking about this process and what, what role in my play and intensification, it, it almost seems like it be a breaking mechanism in intensification in terms of transfer, transporting moisture into the core. Because the environment is kind of degraded in the lee of these features, right? The bottom layer is degraded. If somewhere. there's dry air outside of it, too. Right. It mixes, mixes yeah. that in. I, so in that case, you would have yeah. like decreased at least within that, yeah. that mode. Within that mode. It's this constant battle in my mind where if the surrounding environment is moist, it's okay. If there's a lot of dry air hanging around outside, you can really collapse things. The storm is always working to clean out the environment. Though. That's what it's doing with these pulses. But if the environment's kind of ragged outside, very dry, I think, like Derek's saying, you can disrupt the periphery of the storm. That would be a, that would not be a good thing. In the nature of the work, did you? I'm trying to remember if you played around with some of the radiation settings on there to see if you got different results. I don't know. We wanted to play with radiation, but the computer that created that nature run was decommissioned. So you, you can't truly recreate the nature run ever again. <laughs> Everything's going to be different. Yeah, but we didn't want to take the effort given that we didn't even have the same machine. But we did play around with some, some simple models and those really strong signals that you have. But yeah, it's a good point. You're never going to recreate it once you start tweaking with it, right? Um, I'm interested in the timing of, of this. I mean, if we think of this as an inertial gravity wave probably an hour, the forcing mechanism is occurring then late in the evening, early evening? Probably after sunset. You know, one, <coughs> one thought, and Morgan O'Neill had a nice paper on this, was that the, you're cooling the CDO very rapidly. Maybe, you know, can you the CDO sorry, the Sears can't be. The Sears, yeah, central yeah. dense or overcast. Yeah. yeah, you start talking below the level. So, so maybe that cooling can change inertial stability at the top of the storm, and maybe the the upper level anticyclone that outside can receive these pulses more readily in that kind of environment. The heating and cooling of the CDO of the Sears canopy may be a key player here. We don't know. So, that rather than. Probably that rather than underlying convection. Because there's a lot of bubbling that goes on all throughout the day. We go chasing after these convective bursts at high noon with the P3 when we have these patterns around them. So my hunch is the only thing that changes so dramatically every day, you see it now, that radiation to g was the heating and cooling of the CBO. Everything else down below is, is more minor. Still probably important, but I really think the changes at the top are so regular that that's probably the driving bus. I was wondering is whether or not this, I mean, so the spatial scale associated with that forcing of an inertial gravity wave, I was wondering is whether or not you can find some sort of similar analogy in a non-organized convective case to so give you some sort of indication of whether or not the forcing mechanism is that. That would, that would be interesting to look at. I have a feeling looking at some of these shabbier storms that if you don't have a good central dense overcast, it's hard to get this process going. Yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm not thinking as much the, I'm not thinking as much the, uh, uh, the propagation of a, of a coherent wave away from the more just like you see a response to the yep. Nearest, yep. The, to get it going. There definitely could be some kind of a low level forcing mechanism. Oh, I, I, yeah. yeah. My hunch is it's at the top because of the regularity, but I've learned never to go, you know, keep an open mind with this stuff because anything could be going on. But yeah, I think there's more, a lot more modeling that can be done here to kind of crack it. John? Yeah. Um, I'm 
Yeah, along the lines of the modeling, which I think is really important. I think you made a great case for this being something fundamental. Um, but it seems like we can hand wave, but we so far we can't really dig into what is this creature. You yeah. want to get it, give it a name. Yeah. Do we understand what an inertia gravity wave is in, in that kind of saturated environment, right. in, in a vortex motion, yeah. etc.? So um, the people taking the best runs that actually in a major run that actually reproduce this transient mode and done a careful di uh, diagnostic analysis of the physics of that beast that comes out of that numerical simulation. I think it's. We're in the early stages. So maybe Morgan's paper was early stages. She's kind of looking at this inertial gravity wave response. It tends to get favored, especially if the anticyclone will, will receive it better at night, these waves. She sees that the, when there's a secondary eye wall formation going on, that it disrupts the whole process. So I think we're just starting to crack at it, but I, I think the answer is we're not close yet. We just have bits and pieces of it. Maybe, maybe we really don't know what an inertial gravity wave in that environment really is. Right. I mean, clearly, when you look at that, it's a rock in the pond, right? Yeah. The fact that these things are so circular, it's hard to argue that it's not something like that. But Sometimes, I don't. Sometimes astronomers seek an analogy with these spiral bands and hurricanes. Mm -hmm. It seems like a bit of a stretch. <laughs> hey, so well, maybe not a stretch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, all your clock was relative to distance from the core. Why don't you see different behavior for big versus small? Yeah, the size does make a difference, right? So since I was looking at major hurricanes, <coughs> I, was, I was tending to bias myself to be okay. that. But you might have heard me say once or twice when we were looking at those junky storms. I'm like, oh, it's a little bit ahead of the clock. Well, it's because it's, Small. it's a smaller system. Okay. So yeah, you're right. You can scale this. It doesn't change a ton because it's so slow moving, but you're right. You're totally right. Any other questions? Is there any prediction about what the outcome is? You're talking about the people with their storm shutters, things like that. But is there a consistency enough to say, oh, this is going to happen here? I don't know the answer to that. So if you're thinking about those landfall before the landfall, yeah. At this point, you know, if I saw this and I was near Mexico, I'd start looking at the radar. But that's just because I've been obsessed with this stuff. But I don't think there's a predictability to it yet. I think how coherent that thing looks as it approaches the coast depends on the environment, too. So I think there is room to grow, but maybe not. We don't, maybe don't have it rock solid yet. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.